They're a lot closer to GPUs than they are to real CPUs. Although they are universal, right, you have to really do quite a lot of work in order to access one. You have to join a cloud queue for an hour, and then you have to wait for your slot to come along and hope they don't go down for a recalibration window. It's very, very complicated. It's very, very fun. It's like a game of roulette, except it takes forever, and you have to trust that the other person isn't rigging the game on the other side. So quantum hardware hacking is a thing that I started to call the extension of my old work. My, na my name is Mark. I am the co-organizer with Victoria of Quantum Village. Some of you may know me better as Large Cardinal, where I did a load of hardware hacky stuff like long time ago. Um, like I also did stuff like calling out like Cran Sterling a few years ago. That was kind of fun. I nearly got sued, but didn't. So, what we're going to talk about today is quantum hardware hacking. What are we going to be doing with quantum hardware that is very hacky, that is hackish, that is actually interesting? And I'm going to walk you through some ideas that I've had, some ideas I've managed to make work, and other ideas that we're sort of pushing forward at the village. So hardware hacking for this has a very loose definition that is going to be changing and morphological as we go through this particular presentation. So without further ado, let's introduce my little companion. This is Blocky. It's like Clippy, but for, you know, Quantum. No? It looks like you're trying to hack a quantum computer. <laughs> Do you want to make a, install a malicious circuit? Do you want to redirect global traffic for a targeted SNDL attack? Or do you want to put a quantum algorithm where none has been put before? Do you want to also spell algorithm correctly in, the, in that slide? But never mind. <laughs> you know, I, I proofread this as early. So this is part one. Part two of this talk is going to come later in the year at a conference to be confirmed. We're going to give you a little bit walking tour of where we're going to be going today, OK? This is the roadmap. So we're going to have a little refresher, the road to Y2Q. You've probably seen that Q Day is coming. Y2Q is on the way. We're going to give you a little bit of a context switch, a little bit of a way of going, you know what? Here's what's really going on, OK? Now, how are we going to actually sort of do this? We're going to say Q Day is coming. It is. It is the 14th of April, 2030, according to the Cloud Security Alliance. OK? In case you're wondering, um, it's a Sunday. So you know, don't take that weekend off. Make sure you're working. Because uh, that's, that's when it goes down, according to the Cloud Security Alliance. This seems a little bit oddly specific. But nevertheless, this is what we've been given. OK? And some people say, oh, it's probability. It's going to be 50-50 you know, by that time. And I get that. But the headline was pretty strong. And I was like, I can't tell yet if this is helpful or not. So when you talk about quantum security, security quantum technology for security, there's a lot of interesting things you get told. OK? I have legitimately been on a vendor call. And I was told that space lasers are going to fix my security. And I was like, oh, wow, oh my god, what space lasers? It's amazing. Oh, wow. OK, what is quantum? OK? Is it just space lasers? No, it's toilet paper. This is a brand of toilet paper from the UK called Quantum. <laughs> so you can literally wipe your. Anyway, so a quantum is just the smallest piece of a thing, OK? A quantum of something. Quantum effects, well, you've heard about some of them already. Entanglement, superposition, OK? It, it sounds dodgy, I know. It sounds like some kind of blooper reel from a very dodgy, bluey film. But really, these are the phrases that are used, and they have a lot of very rigid mathematical meaning, OK? So everything you see has a good chunk of maths underneath it. I say this because I'm a mathematician. That's what I do for fun, really. I love it. If you want to come and talk maths, talk mathsy to me. When entanglement is used, you see it less than you see superposition. So when you do these, see these talks, you'll often see that superposition is the real kind of workhorse. Entanglement becomes something that gets more and more important as, as we go on through different areas of effect. So four domains. First is quantum computing. How would it affect classical cryptography is a big question. The next one is post-quantum cryptography. OK, how are we going to combat the threat that we just found on the quantum computers, right? And then you've got quantum key distribution. You just heard a kind of a tete-a-tete -tete debate, right? You've also heard some talks. You're going to hear more talks tomorrow, OK, on this particular subject. This is where you use quantum physics to actually fix things, OK? And the, reason, the, the idea is, is that because it's quantum physics, even a quantum computer with all of its optimizations and speed-ups can't break through, OK? 
And then you have quantum algorithms. Now, quantum algorithms are actually really useful, okay? Quantum computers could have some major superpowers, especially when it comes to optimization problems. So traveling salesman-esque problems, finding global minima. At the moment, we use these very slow gradient descents, like in machine learning, right? These very slow, very careful descents. And if you have these graphs that do this, you're, you, you find one and you go, oh, that's low enough. With quantum, in theory, you could just go, it's here. And there's the answer. So with the, um, it's not quite that straightforward, but you know, romantically speaking, that's kind of where we're trying to get to. So these are the kind of four domains to keep in mind throughout this entire talk and indeed the entire village. Now, here's a theorem. I put bunny ears simply because even in the original paper, there's no formal proof, and I'm a mathematician, so if there's no formal proof, it's a little bit difficult to call it a theorem. But the idea here is quite simple. When you have a particular problem, say you want to measure the effectiveness or how long you have to do a post-quantum solution for it, the time trade-off looks something like this. If you have a time Z or Z taken for quantum threats to emerge, that's kind of your upper limit. You then have to have certain requirements. So I you know, work in a large company. We have data retention requirements. You know, for some things, it's seven years. For some things, it's two years. OK, there's lots of laws and things about that. So I have to remember that the last piece of data I encrypt using an old method has to then be kept for seven years. And I have to either re-encrypt it, which requires effort, or just accept that I'm going to have that potential vulnerability for seven years, depending on when a quantum computer comes about. So the idea here is as x and y should be less than or equal to z. If x and y are greater than z, we start worrying. Has problem. All right. What does it look like? Well, 2030 was the date we were given. So here's some you know, Y estimates, about four years to implement a PQC solution. Who thinks it can be done in all enterprises in four years? Good, there's, there's no unicorns here. So if you suppose we did do it in four years, uh, you know, UK police data you have to keep for two years. Whereas commercial data is kept for about four years. Tax records in most countries are kept for seven years. Government records can be kept for 10 or more years. Mortgages, government bonds, long-term kind of uh, uh, financial instruments can be you know, kept as valid for up to 30, 40, 50 years with government bonds. So any kind of digital security you apply to these things now, you eventually have to go, this is going to work and have to maintain working for long after quantum is supposed to be here. Even if you think April 14th of April 2030 is optimistic, you can safely say in 50 years something should have happened with quantum. So the idea is we're always going to be trying to push these things down. Two very useful concepts to think about. And these come sort of from conversations that I've had uh, with my co-conspirator for this village, Victoria, V-Wave. Um, where we have this notion of data depreciation first and data amortization second. Data depreciation, data has a value and that value decays over time. It goes down. This is a fairly you know, blunt force way of looking at it. And I promise the hardware stuff is gonna be coming up. But when we think about these things, it's important to note that underlying this, we have a notion of data that is really, it's like, like, oh, it's always useful or it's never useful. And that's not, uh, none of those are right, okay? What's the, tr the truth of the matter is that data is valid for a particular amount of time. It is valuable for a particular amount of time. And that time, that value in time decreases like that. And how it decreases is also dictated by amortization. Who's familiar with financial amortization? Yep, the idea here is quite similar. So the, 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 the lowering of data's value dictates exactly how we should be approaching it from a kind of an operational standpoint. The more that you have to spend to fix something, the more you should be able to work out the data, that data's depreciation. Case in point, what I paid for my Starbucks this morning, the fact that I had a Starbucks this morning, isn't particularly useful to anyone right now. Right? But what my mortgage rate is, might be. Okay, so these things have various interplays. These are ideas that we're kind of working on. If you've got comments or questions, please do come and speak to us after. We want to get this discussion kind of rolling because people aren't we think, thinking about this too much, or maybe they are. It's very difficult to gain. So thoughts and comments afterwards, I'm going to move on. Let's look then at where these problems come in, all right? 
the QPU tech stack. This is a quick overview. If you've been wondering where all these things sit, you've heard of Python libraries like Ticket and Kiskit and Circ. You've heard of languages like QSharp. I mean, any guess who invented QSharp? Yes, it's Microsoft. Um, you know, D-Wave libraries, also things like Bracket. So Amazon have their own library, and it's quite well put together. I say that because I've contributed a little bit to it. And it's kind of like nice to see that they're also cross-platform. There's a like Ticket or Penny Lane, if you've heard of it. Who here has played with any of these? By the end of this village, I hope all of the hands are going to go up, OK? Now, we also have some uh, quantum computing manufacturers. So we have like Arcs of Quantum Circuits, who are uh, at the back somewhere, uh, sort of ferreting away, um, fixing a quantum computer for us. We have IBM, Regetti. We have different types, so superconducting versus ion trap, continuum, um, make. Uh, we formerly Honeywell uh, make uh, uh, quantum computers that literally suspend atoms individually in radio frequency wells. And then they hit them with lasers to make computations happen. Like, this stuff is so cool, OK? Like, <laughs> however you say it, this stuff is cool, right? You have other sort of ideas like topological qubits, which is what I mean that Microsoft's put a lot of time and effort into. Um, does it work? Well, I would have said, oh, maybe a few months ago or a year ago. But now, there's actually good results that indicate it might. So you're going to see these things develop faster and faster as more and more money, time, and effort is put into them. OK, so what does actually it actually look like when you have a quantum computer? This is a kind of a block diagram. It's a little more detailed than the diagram that you saw earlier. But it's broadly true across most quantum computing stacks that I've had to look at. And I've looked at quite a few because, you know, I like them. They're cool. Like, it's cool. Like, oh, oh, oh you're going to show me how you hit a laser on an individual atom from over there? That's cool. OK, so you have a user. The user interacts with a Python library. The Python library talks to an API. It's all very standard kind of Web 2.0 stuff, right? That then sends some kind of, of instruction to the actual preprocessor. The preprocessor is where the magic is, by the way. That's the real value. Like quantum computers are actually quite straightforward to manufacture if you know what you're doing. The real value is in the optimization. So it's in the compiling, the transpiling, the recoding, all of these things that take it from being a circuit on 12 qubits that's 1,000 slices long with many thousands of gates down to just a few slices and a few dozen gates. OK? There's a lot of work that you've been alluded to. And that's really where a lot of the value of these things is kept. You then have a kind of a staging operation. This is, again, back to things that we really understand very well. Um, the CTO of Oxford Quantum Circuits, for example, used to work in the gaming industry, as in uh, online games. I think, uh, I'm not sure it was EA. But like, you know, he's used to building very big hyperscale things where you have lots of queuing and lots of organization things to do. Like, that's actually the actual engineering problem. That's the quantum computing. Right? as opposed to just quantum magic, which is actually just here. So the message doesn't get sent over to a control system that just turns these constructions into waves. Because waves talk to photons, particles, etc., And those particles then do a thing. You then have some way of measuring it out. So you get the results out. Now, the hacker mindset kicks in at some point, doesn't it? How many of these things are running tech that we're very familiar with, like you know, Windows or Linux or similar, like pretty much all of it. Right? The only thing that isn't is the QPU. Everything else is running a system that we know how to affect and we know has potential vulnerabilities and issues. But the question then becomes, like, well, what would you do? So malicious circuits. You will be told certain things that can't be done. And then you'll realize that actually they can because there's oddly specific parameters in physics. And what we're doing here is we're sort of seeing it and going a little bit around it. So let's just think about this. What happens if we send a quantum circuit? Where could we have hackers poke in? Well, pretty much anywhere, right? Hackers could appear at any point in this tool chain. And that means we actually, as hackers, as people who understand cybersecurity, we should be interested in this. Right? Because quantum computers are getting a lot of attention. They're getting a lot of valuable information passed through them. Okay? At some point, I'm fairly convinced you'll have a pen test which involves a quantum computer stack. Right? And it will be the stack. It won't be the quantum computer, because the quantum computer is just microwaves hitting something that's really cold or in a really empty space, like a vacuum, an ultra vacuum. Right? So the control system, the rest of it, is really where the attack surface lies. Okay? 
So what are we going to do? Suppose you could hack a quantum computer. Well, what next? Suppose you get access to a controller, right? Well, here's a little bit of quantum information theory for you. This little friend is the C knot gate, okay? The controlled knot. So the control is the black blob. The knot is the lower circle with a cross in it. The knot gate does exactly what you think it does. It takes a qubit that is pointing up and it makes it point down. Okay? That's what it does. The control bit means that if the upper qubit is off, then it won't flip it. And if the upper qubit is on, it will flip it. And then you realize that when you actually do the logic gate circuit, it's an XOR on the lower qubit. That's going to be important. Because XOR is addition without carry. Correct? Yeah. So here's what we would do. Here's what I would do. Suppose I'm a hacker and I'm on one of these systems and I have access to the control mechanism. What would I do? I would find empty qubits and I would add C not gates like this. So suppose you have 20 qubits on a quantum system and you have 10 in use. I have 10 free. I can take a full copy. And it's just code. Right? If you've done some of the challenges, this is just code. You just add some code to the thing and then you can take a copy out. Now, some will say, oh, but there's a thing called the no cloning theorem. It's very important, the no cloning theorem. But it doesn't apply here because we're not talking about the total quantum state. We're talking about the state in a basis. Remember, Ket's or Braquet's notation here is always going to be pointing up for zero, pointing down for one. And so our, our basis is in that vertical. Okay? Because that basis is in the vertical, that's where we can actually apply this and get a perfect copy out. And if you'd like, I will happily show you a demonstration of this later. Okay, but that's literally a thing you can do. It seems very simple. It seems like, oh, that should be a thing. But people aren't, I don't think, quite getting some of this. You can also do this. Here's another fun one. So on the left, you have, uh, you can see my mouse, yeah. On the left, you have an entanglement circuit. So if you put a Hadamard gate, that's a superposition. And then with a C not gate, those two qubits are now entangled. Now, this is just an example circuit, so I know what the output's going to be. It should always be 0, 0, or 1, 1. And there's some noise that creeps in, so you get other answers sometimes. But what I'm doing here on the right is I'm adding noise. I'm adding a little rotation. I'm just taking things just slightly out of alignment. And ultimately, in the short term, you probably wouldn't notice. Here is actual graphs. I ran these this morning. OK? So this is on real quantum hardware from IBM. This is quite nice. It's a kind of bias. So you have 0, 0, and you have 1, 1, and there's a few in the middle. Yeah? If you add some noisy gates, and then notice in this circuit, I use a C knot to just add that noise in. Yeah? Then I get a little bit of noise being carried over here. You get noise sort of amping up in the circuit, all right? Now, why is that important? On the short term, you might not notice this. But if this is added to all the circuits that you run, you start being, uh, the, the, the reliability of your circuits, especially as the circuits get longer, the reliability goes down. So it's effectively a quantum DDoS, right? This is what you would do to really sort of mess with the, with the measurements that are going on, OK? And this is the kind of thinking that I think we should be fostering. This is the kind of thing I think we should be looking at to go, what would we look for? What would we try and do? What would we try and say, what is a threat to someone taking over your controller? Apart from just stealing quantum computer time, which is very valuable. I won't give you numbers, but if you want to, come and find me later. Like sort of, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of value in this. Real world issues. I'm, I'm quite sort of keen to talk about the real world problems that we have when it comes to quantum computing. So this is the CIA triangle. We've seen this a dozen times. You might not have seen it in hexagons, but I'm kind of arty like that. I'm not arty at all. I'm totally not arty. Things like certificate management, transport layer security, digital signatures, you know, IPSEC tunnels, tun encrypted confidential communications, key management, identity management, these are all vulnerable. OK? I was once asked by a professor in quantum information theory, what would a criminal do with a quantum computer? Well, suppose you have a certificate that is RSA signed, and you can crack the RSA private key. So you can use a quantum computer to get the factors. What would you do? Well, I would fake a load of credit notes, 
and sign them from the bank. You know, like crime doesn't change. The tools and mechanisms of crime will change, but like, how would I, oh. Whoops, Daisy. The tools and mechanisms of crime will change, but crime itself, no. Now, have I actually seen that? No, like no one's actually doing that. That's not a real thing. But the look of terror on my questioner's face when I said, oh yeah, I just do crime. You know, if I was a criminal. Like, cause I mean, the clue's in the name, right? Like that's kind of what they do. Um, so the idea that we should have have these issues and then I was like, oh yes, but we just shortened the, cir shortened the certificate lifetime. It doesn't matter if the certificate's on a chain and all I'm doing is validating certificates on a chain and the, and the dates line up with a credit note, then it doesn't really matter. I can fake most of those things because, you know, I'm a criminal. So th that's, that's really how these things are going to go down, potentially. This is a mess of a slide. I'm really sorry, but hopefully you'll understand. Something you heard about earlier was a store now, decrypt later. Now, I have a problem with the way this is written. Store now, decrypt later means you take a quantum capable attacker, but they're not quite quantum enough yet. So they just store stuff and then they decrypt it later. When their quantum computer gets good enough, they go and they decrypt it. Now, how is that going to be sort of actuated? What's actually going to sort of happen? Well, if you actually took a dump of all of the internet, or even just all of the data going in and out of a company for a day or 10 days or a year, you've, you could decrypt it, sure, but you've also made a data problem. Interestingly enough, a data problem that I don't think is made any more tractable with a quantum computer. Right? The quantum computer doesn't help you there. Right? So the problem is you, you store this data, you decrypt this data, you still have to go through index and sort. Right? And that's not necessarily trivial. So what would you do? Well, I would focus on known endpoints. So you know VPNs or other sort of point-to-point -point WAN technology. And I would say, well, could I manipulate some BGP to redirect the important traffic encrypted to me and maybe take a copy. Because then I know that I got valuable stuff. It doesn't matter how much valuable stuff I've got. I just search it and I find something valuable. You know? Like, has anyone noticed any BGP attacks? Couldn't possibly comment. Anyway, so the last definition, <laughs> the last way in which, and I know I've got, I've, I've, I'm a little bit ahead of time, but I'm, I'm just sort of going through some ideas that we've had sort of in putting all this together uh, for Quantum Village as it is. Um, we want to sort of also look at hardware hacking in a very different sense. Um, one thing you will find is we're going to boldly put Quantum where Quantum has ever been put before. And there might be a reason for that, but we don't care because we're hackers. So um, we've actually going to release this later today. We've built what we think is the first ever embedded quantum simulator. <laughs> and I've got it here. It's this. It runs on a little Pi Pico. And it has four qubits and a menu uh, and a colorful logo. Um, why did we do this? Uh, because we could. And, you know, and it's kind of cool. And it's actually really handy. I was sitting next to someone on the plane uh, over to Vegas, and I handed it to them, uh, plugged in on the side so they had power. I wasn't mean. Um, and and they, were, they were playing with it for like 10, 15 minutes, and I got a load of work done. And then you know, they sort of had questions at the end, and they were stimulated by the whole, the whole it's in your hand and you can do things with it. You wouldn't necessarily think that this is actually going to make a difference, but then suddenly it does. right? I think that actually this is just a bit of fun. Uh, we're going to release the code later. Um, we do have a couple of these. Um, I know a lot of people pricked up there. We're going to sort of reserve them for CTF challenges first. And then after that, we'll see sort of how we divvy things out based on, you know, whatever. Uh, but it's just a WaveShare bo uh, board and then a Raspberry Pi Pico on the back. And it works really well. I could probably get up to six or seven qubits on it, but then I run out of space on the UI because I build UIs like I build anything else out of dreams and tears. So, so you know, this is, but this is like sort of, this is the thing that you, we should be doing. Like, we should be putting quantum simulators. The code is written as if it's a library. So you could just import this, and then you've got a quantum simulator on, a, on your next Arduino project. You might not want it, but that's a different problem, all right? So another thing we've been looking at is like sort of use of quantum algorithms for security. I alluded to this earlier, right? So 
Who here has ever used or ha ever heard of attack graphs, as in attack networks? A few people. Who here has used Bloodhound? Wow, not that many people from what I, what I anticipated. OK, fine. So for those who don't know, Bloodhound is a tool that treats a network, a Windows AD network, as a graph, a network graph. And it lets you plot routes to domain admin. So attackers think like that, right? We, we think in terms of going from here, finding a way, go to here, find a way around, go to here, and then got the network, right? That's how we think. Defenders, going the other way is much harder, OK? Because you've got to think this way and then very completely think around that problem and then think completely around again and then look for very complicated kind of ideas. And it's not that straightforward. Now, using graphs is a really good idea. I will tell you this is one reason why. If you can, store your vulnerability data as a graph, right? Because whenever you get the data from any vendor, it comes host first. So here's a host with a list of vulnerabilities. You never ask it those questions, though, do you? You go, which hosts have this vulnerability? So you get the data the wrong way around. But if you put it into a graph database, you just look at the edges, choose a node value ID, look at the right edges, and it automatically comes out. Everything takes about the same length of time as everything else, but actually things work really well. Pro tip. And, I, and you can do this on like sort of uh, you know very minimal resources. I recommend it. So we've been looking at how you can actually then apply quantum to that because you can, because remember the traveling sales problem, traveling salesman problem is just a network problem when you apply it, and you can solve that with some quantum computers. So maybe one day we will have quantum computers fixing patch prioritization because we've started to do some fun kind of toying with it. And it works. I was very surprised. But that was kind of where we were going. So I, I, I've not occupied all of my time, I know. I was going to get down to a very quickly, a very short closing, because I know that it's getting a little bit on. And we're going to have a little bit of a break. And then the last talk is at 4.30, an amazing talk from James Howe. James, are you here? That's a no. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go and hunt James. Um, and he'll, he's going to give you an amazing talk on PQC. He, he lives and breathes it, and it, I think it's great. So closing, have a read. This is a really good book on PQC. This is a really good book on quantum computing. People just say, oh, but I don't know the maths for this. I don't have the math for it. That's fine. The book on the right has all the linear algebra in the last Part. It comes in three parts. The last part is all the linear algebra you need. So with that, I'm going to thank you for your attention. I will take questions. And happy hacking. Thank you. A question. You can shout it at me. I'll repeat it. So the question seems to be, and I might get this wrong, but the question is, uh, how much do we consider the quantum algorithm in play to be vulnerable? You can, you can come up here. It's fine. Oh, yeah. Oh, OK, right. OK, so voltage glitch attacks against quantum computers. Right, um, I don't know of any, mainly because it's very difficult to get close to a quantum computer. I've been trying for years. I mean, it, it, they're, they're, they're quite expensive, I've found, you know, 15, 20 million a piece for some of them. So, um, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not quite as straightforward to get a hold of. So they probably do have lots of side channel attacks, but we don't know about them yet because no one can get close enough to side channel them. <laughs> question. So the question is, why couldn't you fix a noisy neighbor attack with uh, regular signal processing methods for line noise? Uh, you absolutely can. The point is, is that you're still applying a statistical bias deliberately that is actually artificial to the system. So when you do it, you reliably get skewed results out the other side. And if you do things like sort of try and do, uh, I tried to do some QML training with it with a, simu with a simulator. So this is all in theory. 
but like uh, the, the model never converged. It, it, it just refused to, to act. Now, could I get that out with some DSP like um, techniques? Yes, I probably could. Um, however, there is the idea that I will probably know what I'm looking for and know what I'm fixing because I know what the attack was. So it would be determining how much it's an attack and detection of it versus something else. So that's a really interesting question. Any others? Well, that's it. Come and get it from here. Thank you very much.